yeah, I've heard of Italian food, but I, I've just never had spaghetti. Am I saying that right? I feel like I should know what it is. I'm look, it's, it looks familiar, you know? I'm excited to try this. Do people eat this? Like, not on a dare? I'm not an idiot, you know what I mean? I just don't know um, how to approach it. I have multiple of them on here. Is that okay? You guys are messing with me. You're messing with me. I mean, it looks like a thousand dead snakes bleeding. Ammazzo, però è lungo. Sono lunghi sta cosa. Ah, the world of starches. So, potatoes, grains, and pasta. Welcome, pro star students. This is chapter number seven. This is Chef Hawks. We're going to dive right in. Let's first of all start on potatoes. So, all potatoes are tubers. This is the way that they grow underground. And the tubers uh, are underground stems that can grow a new plant from each of those and then start to multiply under the ground. Potato types vary with starch and moisture content. And so we have two main blocks, um, but this can be subdivided down to a third one where we have some that are kind of in between. But so generally, we have high starch potatoes. These are the dense, firmer potatoes that are good for baking and frying. Then we have low starch potatoes, which generally tend to be smaller. They tend to be immature potatoes, new potatoes, and they're good for boiling and steaming. We do have some potatoes available on the market that are right in the middle there. And so they can be used in both directions. Um, so uh, medium starch potatoes, uh, they tend to have um, a slightly higher moisture content, um, but they're good also for things like potato salads. So we'll start right in the middle here, the type of ones which we look at, which we call a chef's all-purpose potato. So this has medium starch and medium moisture. They tend to be irregularly shaped and, uh, and sized as well. They, these are good for mashing, pureeing, braising, and sautéing. They're right in the middle there where they can be adapted to a lot of different things. Then we have yellow flesh potatoes. These tend to be the medium starch, medium moisture as well. Yukon Gold is the most common variety of these, and they have a gorgeous golden yellow flesh to them. They're very popular in the United States. These work really well for mashing, pureeing, baking, and frying. New potatoes, and this is where we have Im immature potatoes, ones which are um, very young. They have a very, very thin skin to them on the outside. Um, and so these have a low starch and high moisture content to them. They're very high in sugar. And so they keep their shape well. So if you're boiling them, steaming them, and roasting them in situations where you're not going to break them down like mashing, then they work perfectly. Russet potatoes are high in starch and low in moisture. They're also called Idaho potatoes as well. So these are what we use for our standard baking potato. So they're nice and uh, the flesh inside is mealy and white, but they tend to be fluffy on the inside. We'll talk about that in just a few seconds. But these are great for baking, frying, mashing, roasting, and broiling, where you're looking for that fluffy texture on the inside. You don't need to be embarrassed about not knowing the different varieties, but what you do need to know is there are two types of potato. There are floury and there are waxy. So how do you know if a potato is waxy or floury? The easiest way, really, is to tell by their size. Typically, the smaller potatoes are waxy and the larger potatoes are floury. So it's important to pick the right potato, the right variety, uh, under the right category. Hey, Kevin, how are you doing? Hi, Dan. What are these, mate? These are all a variety, nice and smooth, good for mashing. Okay, so I'm doing some croquet potatoes. Be good for that? These will be spot on, mate. I'll take Just a job. They smell beautiful. Yeah. I'll take these for them. You won't get fresher <laughs> than this, mate. Okay, mate. Cheers. So these are all the potatoes just dug up in Kevin's uh, farm five minutes ago. You can see yourself in front of me. I've got some great variety of potatoes with different colours, different textures, great for different methods of cookery. Desiree potatoes here, lovely, smooth, beautiful for mashing, really wonderful. King Edwards, a great roaster. We've got some Charlottes here, wonderful salad potatoes, 
really great for, uh, as the name suggests, salads or just plain boiling or steaming. Delicious. And the good old Maris Piper, the fluffy potatoes, are great for uh, wedges and uh, chips, that sort of thing. But don't take my word for it. Let's go and cook some, shall we? So we've got our main categories of potatoes here. And all I've done is I've peeled, boiled, and I'm going to mash them. This is the Desiree, so this should give us really, really velvety smooth mashed potato. I've not added anything to it, so there's no cream or butter or even salt and pepper going in. I want to see exactly how different they are. In comparison with that, look at this one. Beautiful bright yellow colour, but actually, as I mash, it's quite firm. And this is a Charlotte potato, so this is an ideal salad potato. And it is fantastic tasting, but not great for mashing. It'll still mash, don't get me wrong but you can see the difference. If I move across here, now these are our Maris Piper, and this is what we're looking for when we're roasting potatoes. You know, we plain boil them, and we get all these rough edges, and they're the rough edges that pick up all the, uh, the vegetable oil in the roasting tray and give you that lovely, crackly roast potato. For me, the flavor of the Ziri is, is slightly better than the Maris Piper as a mash. It won't roast as well as the uh, Maris Piper. Whatever you do with these potatoes, the taste is gonna be there. It's the quality of what you're trying to end up with. So mashed potatoes, stick with your Desiree, whether it's boiling or for salad, stick with your Charlottes. You just get a better end result. So we'll get some in the oven here and look. The lovely Charlotte or the salad potato. I've just sort of boiled those. No butter, no stock, just in water, crush them down a little bit. I've added some uh, spring onion and some seasoning. I just made it like a potato cake. Really tasty, no fat in there, very, very healthy potato. Uh, these two have come from Desiree potatoes. Really good mashing potato, silky and smooth, with a bit of uh, tomato in there. And this one rolled in flour, egg wash and breadcrumbs and some nibbed almonds in there as well. So just to recap, in our two major categories, we have things like our new potatoes, which are low in starch, high in moisture, and they hold their shape really well because they have a waxy flesh. And then when we look at our russet potatoes, um, these are the ones that have a more floury flesh. And so these are perfect for being able to, uh, for being able to use that nice floury type of flesh in various different things like roasting potatoes, baking them, frying them, mashing them. They work really well in all those cases. Let's move on now to sweet potatoes. So these are high in starch, low in moisture. They have this wonderful orange glow with their flesh, and it's a mealy type of flesh to them as well. They have a high sugar content, and these are great for boiling, baking, pureeing, and roasting. We have yams, which sometimes can be mixed up uh, between the two, but they are not related to sweet potatoes. These have a high starch and low moisture content. These originated in Asia, and so they have more natural sugar and moisture than sweet potatoes do. These are great for baking, pureeing, and frying. When we're selecting our potatoes, we always want to make sure that we're uh, that we're storing them somewhere where it's dry, so that they can be so that they can be maintained dry, firm, and smooth. You don't ever want to be seeing dark spots or green areas and sprouting and soft spots and mold and then let any large cuts and bruising from where they were harvested. This is where, um, when you get the green areas, that's the chlorophyll, where they're actually trying to start to, uh, start uh, reproducing into new plants because they've been exposed to too much sunlight. We'll talk about more of that in a little while. So the market options that we generally tend to have, we can purchase them fresh, frozen, refrigerated, canned, and dried. When it comes to storing, we're looking for between 45 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So not refrigerated, but on the cooler side in a chilly room. You want them to be in a cool and dry place. You want to have a ventilated container with indirect light. You don't want to have direct sunlight hitting on them. Potatoes that are exposed to light will turn green, and this is because of increased levels of chlorophyll, because they're a plant, um, and solanine as well. Now, this isn't necessarily a dangerous thing um, for most human beings, but if you have significant amounts of green where the, where the potato turns all the way through its flesh green, um, then it can give you a bit of an upset stomach 
if you if you eat a significant amount of this a little bit of green on a potato uh, won't be that won't be harmful to you though so we generally would be looking to store potatoes for about a week so we're not going to purchase enough for the next six months and store because you're probably going to find they're going to start shooting um, and they're going to start turning green and then you're going to be having potato plants all over your kitchen Potatoes are a very inexpensive and nutritious and very, very versatile product that we like to use. So we can boil them, steam them, uh, bake them, deep fry, puree. They're really a, a fantastic thing for us to be able to use in our cooking and our culinary because there are so many different dishes that we prepare while we're making these. There are different potato products that we, that we like to use, and it varies on the different types of uh, of techniques that we use with them. So these are broken down into a couple of different things for our potato dishes. We have single stage techniques, which is where we're baking, boiling, maybe deep frying. And then we have multiple stage techniques, things like Leonese potatoes. Add the potatoes and cover them with water. Season them with a little salt and bring them to a simmer. Still simmering, cook them for two minutes, then drain them through the colander. And set them aside. Step three, fry the onions. Place the frying pan onto a medium heat. Add some of the butter. Then add the onions. Season with salt and pepper and slowly sweat the onions for roughly 10 minutes, stirring them occasionally to help them brown evenly. You may also need to add a little more butter. Then when almost caramelized, place them into a bowl. Step four, fry the potatoes. Add a little more of the butter to the pan, and then add the potatoes which you may need to cook in batches. Season them with salt and pepper, occasionally turning them over with your tongs and browning them on both sides until cooked. Bear in mind that each variety of potato will brown differently, so don't be afraid to keep adding more butter if needed. Once they're done in golden brown in color, add them to the bowl of onions. Cook all the potatoes in this way. Step five, combine and serve. Transfer the onions and all the potatoes back into the pan. Sprinkle over the parsley and mix it all together. Let's take a look at some of the versatile ways that we can prepare potatoes that will yield a different result every time. So we're boiling. So this is a very easy cooking method, adding them uh, into water and bring them up to a simmer. Um, the, this is the first step in other methods like pureeing. So steaming, this is good for new potatoes. Uh, this actually helps to keep their shape so they don't get broken down at all. Um, and you can also uh, cook them in water until they're tender. And then uh, baking is where we serve them in their skins and so you're either going to wrap them in foil or rub them over with oil make sure you season with some uh, with some salt and pepper uh, idaho's and russet potatoes are really great for baking so if we're boiling our potatoes you place the potatoes in a pot of cold water um, make sure you have some salt in there as well it brings it to a simmer quicker but also then we're seasoning the potatoes potatoes don't have a huge amount of flavor and so it's important that we season them well so that we can maximize the flavors that are in them. Potatoes are wonderful, though, because we can also add other things to them to bring out more flavors and to develop flavors in them as well. Make sure you have enough liquid that it covers the potatoes. Bring them to the boil and simmer them until they're done. Uh, you can test them for doneness by piercing them with a fork or with a sharp knife. And then you can serve them immediately or you can hold them for up to an hour just make sure to protect them, maybe wrapping them in foil or something like that so that they don't dry out. When we're steaming potatoes, as we can see in the picture here, this is a steamer. 
So this is where you would put them into a perforated pan, a pan that has uh, small holes in them. And this, uh, and you would add a single layer so that you get even cooking. If you try and pile them up several layers higher than ones in the center, are not going to be cooked at the same speed that the others are. Then you steam the potatoes until they're done, again testing them for doneness with either a fork or a sharp knife. And again, you can serve them immediately or you can hold them for up to an hour, keep them wrapped so that, that way they don't dry out. With baking potatoes is where you scrub the potatoes clean on the outside. Remember, the potatoes grew under the ground, so they're going to have some dirt on them. Um, but just give them a quick scrub and then pierce them with a fork. If you do not pierce them with a fork, then you risk pressure building up inside from the water content that's inside those baking potatoes um, and they can pop, they can explode. Um, but this way you, you're actually able to let the steam um, come out from them and it will it'll actually help them to slightly dehydrate, especially on that surface level where you want to have the jackets of those potatoes kind of firm up so you get this wonderful contrast between the fluffiness on the inside of the potato and, and that firmness of the uh, of the skin on the outside. You can cook them directly on the oven rack or on a sheet pan, and they can be either oiled over, as you can see in the picture there, or you can wrap them uh, wrap them in foil as well. Testing them for doneness, again, fork or a sharp knife, and then you, it's best to serve these immediately, otherwise they do tend to dehydrate rather quickly after that. When we're pre preparing different baked dishes, we cook them in casseroles. So as you can see, this is a casserole, the casserole dish itself. We can combine the potatoes with cream or sauce of some sort, and we can bake them in a buttered pan. And this, this way it's very easy to be able to portion them and hold them for later use as well. When we sauté the potatoes, as we saw uh, with the Lyonnaise potatoes, that those are sautéed potatoes, um, and I've, we have an example right over here in the picture as well of other sautéed potatoes where they've been grated or shredded. So this, uh, this is best to use a chef's potato, the all-purpose potatoes for these. It gives a good crisp exterior and a nice tender fluffy interior. You can cook them in oil or butter, clarified butter, and make sure you flip them so that they don't over uh, overdo on one side without uh, completely cooking all the way through on the inside. Popular versions of these are potato lackeys and potato pancakes. Deep frying. So this is the beloved French fry, known all around the world. Sometimes in some places called chips, as we call them in England, but for all intents and purposes, and this is where we are frying, our, we are deep frying our potatoes. So this is where we can make french fries, cottage fries, steak fries, the big fat fries. And so we're going to be frying them in fat at about 350 to 375 Fahrenheit. We're serving these immediately. You cannot hold them, otherwise they lose that crispness and the fluffiness on the inside. But there is a technique uh, to when we're actually deep frying potatoes to come out with the best version of a french fry. Let's take a look.
mashed and puree potatoes are very popular. Pureeing is often the first step in many dishes that we make as well. So mashed potatoes, duchesse potatoes, potato croquet. And so we can boil, steam, or bake them first, and then combine them with other ingredients to actually come up with our mashed or pureed potatoes and make them into other dishes too. Let's take another look at mashed potatoes, how we would actually go through that process as well. Boiling and mashed potatoes. Begin by preparing the potatoes. You may peel or cut larger potatoes into smaller pieces. Basically, it's the chef's choice. Then, place the potatoes in a large stock pot with cold water and about three tablespoons of salt. Turn the burner on high heat and bring the water to a boil. Simmer until the potatoes are fork tender. You can use a fork to pierce one of the potatoes to test this. If you can easily push the fork in, the potatoes are done. Drain very well, then return the potatoes to the pot. Add the cream, butter, and seasonings. Then mash the potatoes until smooth. Serve hot. And that is how to boil and mash potatoes. Moving on now to legumes and grains. So legumes are the seeds from pod producing plants. So these are often dried and this way it, they actually will keep for a significant length of time. Uh, but you can get them in other, in, in other ways as well, sometimes canned and various other ways as well. So they're a great source of carbohydrates and a significant source of fiber. So the four categories of legumes that we look at are beans, peas, nuts, and seeds. So seeds are from, a, uh, from legume plants are uh, often kidney shaped, as we can see in some of these pictures, you know, some of these items in the picture here. And there's, but there's huge varieties of sizes and colors and shapes. Let's take a look at several different types now that we very often use in our cooking. So we have the black or turtle beans. These are large with black exteriors, uh, with light creamy interiors to them with a sweet flavor. They're used in soups, stews, salsas, salads and side dishes. Annalini or Italian kidney beans are medium white, white kidney shaped. They have a nutty flavor to them. These are used traditionally in minestrone soup, but also in salads, stews and side dishes as well. Cranberry beans are nothing to do with cranberries. They're actually, it's actually more to do with the markings, the maroon markings that they have on them. But they're small and round, they have a nutty flavor to them, and they're used in soups, stews, salads, and side dishes. But the wonderful color that they have, and the contrasting color that they have, is great to give some uh, great depth of color, as well as that nutty flavor to all of your dishes as well. Fava, or broad beans, are large, flat, oval, tan beans. They're popular in Mediterranean and Middle Eastern cuisine, used in falafel, soups, stews, salads, and side dishes. Garbanzo beans, or chickpeas, are a medium acorn-shaped beige-colored pea. 
And so they have a wonderful nutty flavor. They're used popularly in ethnic dishes, used in things like couscous, hummus, soups, stews, salads, and side dishes. Great Northern Beans are large, slightly rounded white beans. They have a very mild, delicate flavor that can take on lots of flavors from other foods. They're used in soups, stews, casseroles, and side dishes. Kidney Beans are a medium kidney-shaped bean. They have either a pink or maroon color to them. They have a full-bodied flavor. So these are used in things like chili con carne, uh, refried beans, beans and rice, soups, stews, casseroles, and side dishes, because they lend so much to those items. Moving on now to lentils. So these are small and round. These can be in all sorts of different types of varieties as well, from French European style to Egyptian to red and to yellow. They can uh, add some amazing flavors, but some fantastic vibrant colors to your dishes. They're served as accompaniment, whole or pureed as well. They can be used in soups, stews, salads, and side dishes. Lima beans or butter beans um, are a medium white pale green, uh, white to pale green color, and they are uh, a slightly kidney shape to them. And they have a buttery taste. These are used in succotash, soups, stews, salads, and side dishes. Mung beans are a small round green bean. They're sprouted from bean sprouts, sprouted, sprouted for bean sprouts. And these are ground into flour to make cellophane noodles and in bean threads as well in Asian cooking. Navy or Yankee beans are a small round white bean used in baked beans, chilies, soups, and salads. Pinto beans, or red Mexican beans, are a medium beige with brown streaks uh, running through them. They're kidney shaped as well. These are used in chili, refried beans, stews, and soups. Soybeans are a small red, yellow, green, brown, and black in color. The uh, P, uh, they tend to be a P shape going over to a cherry shape. They have a bland flavor to them, but so these are very high in, in protein, and so they're actually used quite often in lots of different ways. Sometimes in Asian cuisine, where they're fermented and actually used in pastes or in sauces, and also they can be used to create a texturized vegetable protein for vegetarians as well. They're extremely versatile in that in that type of manner. The dried version is a mature bean, and so these are used in soups, stews, casseroles, and side dishes. Black eyed peas are a small beige with black eye in, uh, in the center there. They're kidney shaped. These are used in hop and john soups and side dishes. Pigeon or gandolas, these are heirloom, heirloom beans. These are something that's been tracked way back and haven't been altered or genetically modified in many, many generations. So they're small, they're nearly round with a beige orange spotting on them. These are popular in African, Caribbean, and, it's, and Indian dishes. Split peas are a round, um, a small round and split pea. As you can see in the picture there, they actually break in half. They have an earthy flavor to them, and they're used in things like split pea soup, salads, and side dishes. When cooking beans, if you're using old beans, or adding your acids too early, you're doing it all wrong. Using old beans may be tempting, they may be cheap, you may have them in your cabinet, but it's probably the worst thing you can do if you want to make a delicious pot of beans. Anything over two years is probably too old to eat. The beans can take a hard, dense texture to them, and worse off, they can never cook. Another way to ensure that your beans never soften is to add acids in the beginning, whether it's lime, tomatoes, molasses. These are all things that keep the skins hard, and they're never going to soften. Another mistake is not having enough water or too much. And the problem with not having enough water is you're constantly going to be adding water throughout cooking, and this is going to really disturb the flow of the beans. And if you add too much water, your pot liquor or bean broth is going to be really bland and not exciting. But in fact, it should be probably the best part of the meal. And the last thing you're doing wrong is you're boiling the beans for too long. When you first cook the beans and you bring them up to initial boil, 
You boil them, and you boil them, and you boil them, and then you keep boiling them, and then you wonder why your beans have turned to mush. Now I'm going to show you the right way to make beans. The first thing we want to do is start with beans that are fresh. And by fresh, I still mean that they're dried, but I mean they've been harvested within two years and kept at optimal storage. The next step is to soak them. A two to six hour soak is optimal. If you do it over that and the beans are really fresh, they actually constrict and start to sprout and get harder. Take your pot that you're going to cook them in, saute onion, garlic, maybe a little celery, a little carrot if you like, and some olive oil or some freshly rendered lard, and wait till they get really soft, and then you can continue with the cooking. Once your aromatic vegetables are nice and soft, it's time to add the beans and the water. The next question is, do you want to use the soaking water? And um, I do. You're leaching out some of the vitamins and possibly some of the flavor, and if you change the soaking water, you're going to throw that out in the sink. Just make sure that the beans are covered by about two inches of water before you start cooking. Once you've given the beans in the pot a good stir, you're going to bring it to a really hard boil. And you want a really hard boil, but you only want it for about 10 minutes. Now that the beans have enjoyed a long, hot journey in boiling water, we're going to turn down the flame really low and just give them a gentle simmer. And this can take about an hour, sometimes two hours, never more. You'll know they're about three quarters of the way done when you stop smelling only the aromatics and you really smell that bean flavor. This is about the time you're also going to want to start thinking about salting. For about a pound of beans, you're going to use a rounded tablespoon of salt. And then that means you're going to cook for about another half hour. You can tell they're completely done by popping them in your mouth and burning and screaming. Or you can take a spoon, blow on it gently, and you'll see the skin wrinkle. If you've done all these steps right, you now have soft, delicious beans, a gorgeous pot liquor or bean broth that you can eat as soup. You've got something you can serve to vegetarians and meat eaters alike. And you've made a great pot of beans. And you did it. On to nuts now. So we're going to start off with almonds. So these are a tear sh uh, teardrop shape. They have a pale, tan, woody type of a shell to them with sweet flavor. They're available in shells or already shelled, blanched, sil uh, slivered, sliced, split, chopped, and ground. So we produce lots of almond paste, almond butter, and almond oil from these uh, from these nuts as well, which are used in lots of different methods in our in our kitchens we can use them raw and in baked goods confectionery as well as granola and curry dishes too brazil nuts are a large triangular shape they have a brown a dark brown exterior to them with a very hard shell the white interior is a very rich oil a rich nut and this is, these can be eaten raw they can be toasted they can be cooked and added to baked goods as well Cashew nuts are a kidney-shaped uh, nut. They have a tan uh, outer to them. They have a buttery, uh, slightly sweet flavor to them. They're generally only sold, uh, sold in the hold format, where they've already been removed from their shell. You can make cashew butter with them. You can eat them raw, toasted, cooked, and in various baked goods as well. Chestnuts are a large, uh, round to tear shape, uh, uh, teardrop shape. They have a very hard, glossy, dark brown shell on the outside with an off-white nut on the inside, as you can see in the picture. They have a sweet flavor to them. They're available either in shells, and they can be canned in water or syrup, frozen or dried or pureed. They can be eaten raw, eaten raw cooked, roasted, boiled or pureed. They're very sweet, and they're great for working with very sweet dishes and savory dishes alike. Hazelnuts or filberts, these are small, almost round in shape, and they're smooth with very hard shells on the outside. They have a very rich, sweet, delicate flavor to them. They're available either in shelled or, or already shelled. They can be blanched, whole, or chopped, and eaten raw, toasted, cooked, or in baked goods, salads, and cereals. And these are great in either sweet or savory dishes as well. Macadamia nuts are nearly round in shape. They're an extremely hard. They have an extremely hard shell on the outside to them, with a golden yellow nut on the inside. They're very rich and slightly sweet, with a real buttery type of flavor. That's why they work really well with baked goods. As you have white chocolate macadamia cookie is one of the most popular ways that people enjoy them. But they can be eaten raw, roasted in baked goods and confectionery. Um, and they can be available in, um, they're generally only available already pre-shelled because that shell is so hard, they're very difficult to get into them otherwise without damaging the nut on the inside. P 
Peanuts are a tan brown-like shell, uh, which is more like a pod on the outside. Um, it's a papery brown skin that they have around them, and then they have an off-white colored nut on the inside. These are technically legumes. Uh, they have a sweet flavor to them. They're available either in the shell or already shelled, um, or and indeed already skinned as well. And so we make peanut butter and peanut oil with them. They can be eaten just raw, roasted, or in baked goods and confectionery as well. Carnes are a smooth, hard, and very thin oval-shaped shell. Uh, they have, they're two lobes, so they come with two halves. As you can see in the picture, we have multiple uh, pieces of these lobes, but you would actually get two of these lobes in each shell. Um, so they have a brown nut on the outside with a cream-colored interior to them. They're very rich and buttery in flavor. And they're available either in the shells, pre-shelled, halved, chopped, and they can be eaten raw, roasted in baked goods, pies, confections, and on salads as well. Pine nuts or pignolis are a small elongated kernel, and they're about half an inch long. They have a very light tan color. So these come from um, a number of different pine trees. A lot of pine trees that produce pine seeds or pine kernels um, are actually, they're too small to actually be used to be yielded from those trees. But there are over a dozen uh, pine tree types that produce them where they're large enough to be, uh, to be yielded from them. So they have a light tan color. These are technically a seed, but they have a buttery mild flavor to them. They can be eaten raw, toasted, roasted, in baked goods. Traditionally, we would use these in pesto uh, to give some bulk to the pesto sauce that we make as well. They can be used in sweet and savory dishes. Pistachios have a tan uh, green uh, colored nut. They have a subtle sweet flavor to them. They're available either whole or in their shell. They're roasted, usually salted. And actually, the most predominant place on Earth where they're grown is in Iran. Um, the shells sometimes, uh, the shells sometimes are uh, dyed red, and they're often eaten either raw or roasted. They can be added in either sweet or savory dishes as well. Walnuts have a light brown shell, um, and they, they can either be very thick or thin. The nuts are brown, and they have a tender, oily uh, texture to them. And they're very mild flavor, slightly bitter, so you have to be careful when you're adding these into different foods to make sure that's not going to clash with anything else. Um, the walnut oil is a very expensive product that's made from walnuts, and it has a wonderful uh, effervescent type of flavor to it that works really well in things like salads. We can either eat them raw, roasted, in baked goods, confections, on top of salads, toasted, either in sweet or savory dishes. Let's look at a few seeds now. So we have things like flax seeds. So flax seeds are these tiny oval shaped seeds. Uh, they're golden to dark brown in color. They have a mild nutty flavor. We actually make linseed oil from flax seeds. And this is used in baked goods, hot and cold cereals. They're very high in, in omega-3 and 6 fatty acids, which can actually be very good for us. Poppy seeds are the tiny blue to black colored seeds. Uh, they, they're crunchy, especially when we toast them up. Um, they have a slightly musty flavor to them. These, uh, these are used to fill and top baked goods, uh, things like breads, as you can see below, and in salad dressings as well. Um, and they're very much used in European and Middle Eastern cuisine. Pumpkin seeds or pepitas um, are used in, uh, are used in lots of different dishes, but these are small, flat, oval, and soft seeds that come from pumpkins, and so uh, they have a cream-colored hull to them, and and they can also have a greenish to brown, oily interior. These have a very delicate flavor, and they're available either whole or hold. Um, usually, they're salted in some sort of way. But they can be eaten raw, roasted in uh, sweet or savory dishes and baked goods. They're very popular in Mexican cuisine. One one way that we actually like to use them in the kitchen, so that we don't waste them after we've been um, after we've been uh, carving pumpkins and uh, Halloween, is to take them, 
throw either some brown sugar and some cinnamon on them and toast those up, or even put some uh, some ranch flavored uh, uh, salt and seasoning onto them, um, and a little olive oil and roast those up as well. You can make a great little snack. Sesame seeds are used in lots of different ways. They're tiny flat oval seeds, and say they can go all the way from being black to red to tan in color. They tend to be crunchy, and they have a sweet, nutty flavor to them. They can be broken down into sesame oil, which is great to use in salads and dressings. And uh, we can also break them down into a paste that makes tahini, which we then add tahini in with chickpeas that makes hummus. We can eat them raw, toasted, in baked goods, confections, and in garnishes as well. Sunflower seeds are a small, somewhat flat seed. They're a teardrop shape, um, and then they have a woody black and white shell around the outside with a light tan seed on the inside. They have a very mild, nutty flavor, but they're available in the shells or pre-shelled, and quite, uh, quite normally they'll be salted as well. It brings out the flavor in them as they're so mild in flavor. We make sunflower oil from, uh, from these seeds as well. You can eat them raw dried, roasted, and in baked goods and salads as well. Let's look at some other grains now. So grasses that grow edible seeds are what we would term as grains. The meal is coarsely ground uh, seeds of those cereals uh, from the grasses. And so we go and take the grain and the meal and the flour, which we can use in everyday cooking. Whole grains haven't been milled yet, and so this is where we actually um, where we actually hold on to the germ, the bran, and the hull all together. The milling process removes the germ, the bran, and the hull and separates them out. Let's take a look at a typical grain um, now and how it's actually made up. So you have the hull, which is the protective coating um, around it. It's also called the husk as well. Then you have the bran which is the tough layer surrounding the endosperm, which is rich in fiber and vitamin B. And then you have the endosperm. The endosperm makes up the vast majority um, of the actual grain itself. It's a source of protein and carbohydrate. And then the germ, which only makes up about 2% of that kernel. It's the smallest part, and that actually contains a small amount of fat and thiamine as well, a necessary nutrient for us. So stone ground grains uh, are where we actually grind down and, um, and break them down. This retains more of its nutrients. All the parts of the grain are included as they're not uh, as they're not separated out. So this is where we can grind down things like wheat, rice, oat products, and corn products as well. Let's take a look at some common varieties of wheat. So we have berries or whole which is where we actually take the entire pieces that are yielded from the wheat plant. So this is unrefined whole kernels. They're light brown to reddish brown in color, depending on the type of wheat. They have a chewy texture and a nutty flavor. These are used in hot cereals, pilafs, uh, salads, and breads as well. Then we have bran. So this is the separated outer covering of a wheat kernel. So uh, these are brown flakes, are the, uh, the way that we actually yield them from the outside of the berries. And they have a mild nutty flavor to them. They're very, very high in dietary fiber. These are used in hot and cold cereals and baked goods as well. Olga is a steamed, dried, and crushed wheat. And so this is where we have either a fine or medium coarse grain to it where they've been, uh, where they've been ground down. It has a light brown color to it and a tender texture. It's a very mild flavor that can take on flavors of other things. So we use this in hot cereals, pilafs, salads like tabbouleh. And then we also have cracked, and so this is where we crack them down into coarsely crushed kernels. And so this, is ha this has a light brown to reddish brown color, again depending on what type of wheat you're, we're using. It has a chewy texture and a nutty flavor. We use this in hot cereals, pilafs, salads and breads as well. Farina is where we take a uh, where we polish the actual grain itself and we have a medium grind on that wheat. We have it's a white flour like uh, flour like texture to it. It has a very very mild flavor and it's used in hot cereal. 
So, so the germ is where we have the separated embryo of the wheat kernel. It's small and brown pellet-like shape. And so it has a strong nutty flavor, also uh, available in toasted and raw types of products. And so this is used in hot and cold cereals and baked goods. This can uh, be used to increase the food's nutritional value as well. Now onto another type of grain, and that's rice. So we'll look first at Italian rice, or Arborio rice. This is a very short, fat grain, and so it has a very high starch content. It's very, very creamy when it's cooked. These varieties include uh, Carnaroli, Piedmontese, and Violoni Nano. And so these are used in risottos and puddings as well. Basmati rice is a long grain rice, it has a nutty flavor, a delicate texture. These are aged to reduce the moisture that's in the kernels themselves. And they can be brown or white and used in pilafs or salads. Brown rice is a whole grain rice, a whole grain, a whole long grain rice uh, without the husk. It has a light brown color and a chewy texture and a nutty flavor. These are used in pilafs and salads. Converted or parboiled rice, as it's sometimes called, is grain that's been soaked and steamed before removing the husk, the bran, and the germ. So this has a very light brown color. We use this in pilafs and salads. Jasmine rice is an aromatic, nutty flavor. It's also known as fragrant rice. This is used in pilafs and rice puddings, and it has almost a popcorn-like flavor. Rice flour is what we use to be able to make um, uh, different products, but also is used as a thickening agent. It's where we've finely milled the rice. There's a very mild flavor, so it can be used in lots of different dishes and baked goods. Sticky, pearl, or glutinous, or sushi rice uh, is a round, short grain, and it has a very, very high starch content. When we cook this, it's very sticky. It will stick to itself. And that's why it's perfect for making sushi with it, so it all holds together in our sushi roll. It has a sweet, mild flavor. And then we have white, polished rice. And so this is where it's been literally polished so that it has uh, none of the outside husk to it. And so it has a very mild flavor because it's literally pure starch. We use this in pilafs, salads, and rice puddings. Wild rice is a thin, long grain. It has a very, very dark brown outer shell and a chewy texture and a nutty flavor. So this is uh, these are actually grown from marsh grasses that are actually not related to any other types of rice. These are used in salads, stuffings, and very often combined with brown rice or other rices in, in other dishes. How nice does that smell? It smells delicious. Rice in? That's a bit of a different rice. This is arborio rice. It's a perfect rice for risotto. Now, it's really important to sear the rice. If we were just to put the stock in without sweating off the rice, it goes all starchy. So keep on stirring for daddy. Go with our deep red beetroot theme. I'm adding red wine. Followed by the first ladle of stock to get things started. Now we're off. When a risotto is live, when it's like this now, we can't stop cooking it. We have to cook it all the way. Okay, ready for the next ladle? I'm ready. Good girl. Here we go. Ladle in. So we have to make this for literally 20, 25 minutes, and we're nursing it all the way. And we're great. My parmesan. How's that rice doing? Rice is doing good. Now, that is exactly where you want to be now, look. Look at that nice, glossy, textured rice. We use corn for so many different products in our culinary world. So let's take a look at quite a lot of these. So we have cornmeal. So this is where we have the dried kernels. It's white or a yellowish or even up to a blue kind of a color to it. Um, other varieties include corn flour and polenta as well. And so we use this in hot cereals, baked goods, or as coating when we're frying different foods as well. Cornstarch is the dried kernels of corn where we have, it, have the hull and the germ that's been removed from it. So it's pure white. And so this is a pure starch that we use in baking and as a thickening agent in sauces as well. Grits, this is where we take uh, ground hormony, which that's where we have maize, which is corn kernels that have been soaked in lye. Uh, we use this in baked goods, hot cereal, side dishes, very popular in southern cuisine. 
hominy, uh, as we just mentioned, that's our dried maize, which is co uh, corn kernels, which have been soaked in lye. These can come either canned or dried. We use these in succotash, casseroles, soup stews, and side dishes. Mata is a dried corn kernel, and so this is where we use this uh, soaked in lime water and, and, it, and it's ground. This is very often used in lots of Mexican dishes. So it has a pale yellow color. It's moist in its texture, and um, so this is used for things like tortillas and tamales. Bran is the outer covering of oats, and so this is used in cereals and baked goods. The flour from oat products is a finely milled groats, and uh, this is used a lot in baking. It adds a wonderful, rich, nutty type of flavor uh, to our baked goods. The groats are the crushed, whole grains of oats. And so this, well, uh, these are used in cereals, salads, and stuffing as well. We have a couple of different ways that we get our oats as well. We have rolled or old-fashioned oats. This is where they've been steamed and flattened. And so th these have a pale brown color to them, round flake-like uh, uh, flake -like shape to them. They're used in oatmeal, granola, and different baked goods. Then we can also get steel-cut or Irish or Scotch oats. So this is where the, uh, the, where the groats have been cut into pieces rather than being smashed down and flattened. So they have a brown and chew, uh, brown color and chewy texture to them. They're used in hot cereal and baked goods. Amaranth can be enjoyed either whole or milled. You can actually eat the greens that grow up from these seeds as well. They have a sweet flavor to them, and they're used in hot and cold cereals, pilafs, and salads as well. Barley um, is generally hulled and, brand, and had the bran removed from it, so it makes it more palatable for us. Uh, we have different varieties, uh, grits and flour, and we use these in pilafs, salads, soups, and also to make whiskey and beer as well. Buckwheat, we uh, have this either whole or milled, it has a wonderful nutty flavor to it. We use this in hot cereals, pilafs, and then also used for, pa uh, for flour for making pancakes, bellinis, baked goods, and we can also make noodles with these as well. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, Kasha is either whole or crushed kernels. It a, has a reddish brown type of color to it. It has a toasty, nutty flavor. We use this in pilaf, salads, and breakfast cereals as well. Millet is used either whole or milled. It has a very bland flavor, but it takes on flavors from other things that we add to it. This is used in hot cereals and pilafs. Quinoa is a um, is either served whole or milled. It has these tiny off-white seeds, and so they're actually used in pilafs, salads, puddings, and soups as well. Uh, this is called a pseudo grain because it actually has a complete protein complex to it. It has all of the amino acids that we require. So this is a great alternative for vegetarians who are looking for a, uh, for more protein in their diet. Look at some other uh, grain varieties. We have rye, which is uh, can be served whole, cracked, or milled. It has a light to dark brown color and a real malty, nutty flavor to it. Pumpernickel flour is actually coarsely ground rye. This is used in pilafs, salads, and then flour for baked goods as well. Sorghum is actually generally boiled into a thick syrup. and This is used in porridge, flatbreads, beer production, and syrup. Spelt is whole or milled, and it has a nutty flavor to it, used in pilafs and salads. It's, so this is a great substitute that we can use if someone has issues with wheat allergies. We can use spelt in its place. What should we look for when we're selecting and storing our legumes and grains? So we should look for uh, different products that are available. They can be fresh, canned, dried, or frozen. We should always make sure that the packaging is intact so that there's no contamination that could have occurred. Make sure that they're stored in cool, dry, well-ventilated areas that avoid excessive heat and moisture. Um, we should always discard any moldy, damp, or wrinkled items. We should be, and we can generally store them for one to two years, but generally the best quality um, is achieved if we're eating them within six months that we, re we receive them. Whole grains have a shorter shelf life than milled grains. 
the actual the husk around the outside of them tends to make them go bad sooner. We use them within about three weeks. Always inspect the grains when they're being delivered. The containers should be intact, dry and clean. Make sure that they're stored six inches above the ground where we should be storing everything. Store in a dry, well-ventilated place. You can either store whole, uh, you can actually store whole grains in the freezer as well for longer term storage. Make sure they're well sealed so that they don't get freezer burn. And we can also store brown and wild rice in the refrigerator too. When we're preparing our legumes, make sure that you soak and rinse the legumes before cooking. Uh, we cook to develop this flavor and to remove some hum harmful substances that can be in some legumes as well. They should be firm to the bite when we cook them. They shouldn't be just mushy. With grains, we soak them before we cook them. That can help to soften the hard husk on the outside so we get good even cooking going on. Uh, we cook them uh, by steaming the grains in a double boiler. Uh, pilaf often includes sautéing and simmering um, and then making risotto um, by using things like aborio rice, as we saw uh, on our video. Um, helps in water and broth and we have to make sure that we're stirring them frequently and adding the liquid as we go to get the best um, nice creamy finish to them. When we're trying to soften dried beans uh, we should soak them um, before we cook the actual beans themselves. Make sure that you sort out any pebbles or debris um, or shriveled beans that might be in the mix. You can find these in there. So we should be looking to soak those beans overnight. Now, if you don't have enough time, you can actually put them, uh, we can do what we call a quick soak, where we boil them for five minutes. Make sure that you discard the soaking water and then rinse the beans after that and then cover them with clean water before you start preparing them. Cook the beans until they are soft in, on the inside but still have that nice, uh, that nice firmness on the outside. When we make pilaf, we should heat the oil um, or the butter in the pan, add the onions and sauté the onions, uh, stirring frequently. Add the grains uh, and sauté the grains so we completely coat all those grains with, that, uh, with the oil or the butter. And then we add our liquid to the grains. We then simmer them um, and stir them to keep them from clumping. If we're going to put them in the oven, make sure that you cover them well so that that way the, uh, the moisture doesn't evaporate straight off them. And then add any seasonings or flavorings to them when, they, when they're finished up. Make sure that you cover that pot. Um, and they're done when they're tender. Um, so you should be able to taste those and feel that they're tender. Well, we should only either be simmering them or putting them into the oven to make that pilaf. We should then get nice, even cooking. If you try and boil it rapidly, you're going to get uneven cooking where the outside may actually start to flake apart. And they might start sticking. The grains might start sticking together. Let them rest for about five minutes before we serve them as well. As we saw in the video with making, uh, making risotto, we want to heat the oil or the butter in a pan and the onions and saute them as well, just like we did with the pilaf. And then we're going to add the rice and saute that as well, making sure we're coating all those grains. We're then going to add one fourth of the liquid and we're going to start gently simmering at it and uh, simmering it and allowing the moisture to be absorbed into the rice grains. Then add the remaining liquid as we go through and stirring them as they simmer. When we, re uh, when we remove them from the heat, stir in the butter, grate in some cheese and serve it immediately. Risotto is not something that can wait around because the huge amounts of starch that's in the arborio rice will con continue to thicken it and it won't be like lava flowing out. It's going to start getting stodgy and very unpleasant. When it comes to pasta and dumplings, so dried pasta and noodles store well and cook very quickly as well. It's been a staple of the American cuisine for a long time since immigrants have come into the country, and they can be purchased fresh or frozen and dried. Pasta varieties are named for their shapes. Let's take a look at a few. So we have Essini de Pepe. This is a small rice-shaped uh, pasta that's served with sauce, used in soups, salads, and casseroles. Bean thread noodles. This is where we have these slender, gelatinous uh, threads that are made from mung beans that we mentioned earlier. We use these in soups, stir-fries, salads, drinks, and Asian dishes. 
Capellini comes in thin, thin long strands. The thinner version is called angel hair. Uh, so this is often served with broth, oil, sauce, sometimes just with butter um, as well. Couscous is grain-like in its nature. It's very uh, similar to coarse sand. This is used in hot cereals, pilas, and salads. Elbow macaroni um, is very often used in mac and cheese. And so these are narrow curved tubes. This is served in soups, salads, casseroles, and served with sauce. Fafale is where it's shaped like bow ties, very, very fancy looking. Um, so these are served with sauce and used in soups, salads, and casseroles. Great for garnishing things. Fettuccine is thick, flat, long strands. These are used with cream sauces. Fettuccine Alfredo is a perfect example. Fusilli is shaped like corkscrews. This is used in soups, salads, casseroles, and served with sauce. Israeli couscous is larger than traditional couscous. So this is smooth, round balls in, a, in their shape with a chewy texture to them. They're used in pilafs, salads, and soups. And then we have Italian couscous. This is larger than traditional couscous and used in salads uh, with fish tom and tomato dishes as well. Lasagna is where we actually have our sheets of noodles that have been rolled out. And these are large, flat, wide noodles with ruffled edges very often as well. These are used in casseroles, um, traditionally in something we call a dish of lasagna, uh, which is a, a meat-based, very often mainly beef, uh, but it can have some sausage in there as well with a tomato base, and then layered up with a uh, with a mornay, a bechamel, which is one of our white mother sauces, uh, with uh, cheese in there um, to make it into a mornay that you spread on top to make this wonderful, rich dish. Linguini is a long, flattened strand pasta, and that's very often served with a sauce as well. Orecchetti uh, is a type of pasta which is served um, with curved rounds. It's literally like small ears. Um, and so this is served with sauce and used in soups, salads, and casseroles. Orzo is a small grain shape, almost looks just like rice, um, served with sauces. This is used a lot in soups, but also salads and casseroles too. Penny pasta are short tubes with smooth or ridged shapes uh, edges to them as well. Um, these are served with sauce and they're used in soups, salads and casseroles. Rice noodles are great uh, because these can be used in lots of different Asian-influenced dishes. These are long strands that are made from rice flour. Rigatoni is thick, ridged tubes, served with, uh, generally served with a sauce. These are used in soups, salads, and casseroles as well. And then we have shells. Now, shells can come from uh, come in very, very small sizes, about the size of your uh, your small finger um, um, your, your small fingernail, but all the way up to large shells, um, which can be almost the size of your uh, of your fist. 
These are very often served with sauces. They can be stuffed as well, but they look like a conch shell. They're used with soups, salads, and casseroles as well. Soba noodles are long strands, um, which are actually made with Japanese buckwheat pasta. And so uh, we use these in soups, stir-fries, and Asian-influenced dishes. Spaghetti is a round, long-stranded pasta served with sauces. Udon noodles are thick, long strands similar to spaghetti. These are used in soups, stews, and stir-fries and other Asian-influenced dishes as well. Vermicelli is long-stranded uh, pasta, very, very fine, long strands, um, similar to spaghetti, used in broth, soups, and light sauces. We also have other styles of pasta as well, where we have pastas and dumplings. So dumplings are uh, cooked balls of dough with filling. This can include things like ravioli and, uh, and pierogies. So these are very often used as appetizers, salads, uh, with salads or entrees, and also for desserts too. How do we make pasta? So we make pasta um, or dumplings from a starch and a liquid. So the uh, it can be flour or potatoes, can be the starch, and this produces a stiff dough that can be stretched and shaped. Fresh pasta cooks very quickly, um, Firm pasta, it should be al dente. That's where it still has a bite to it. So make sure when you're cooking dry pasta, you allow for a little extra time. And we use, in uh, to make our fresh pasta, eggs, salt, olive oil, and flour. And sometimes substituting these out for one thing or another. And then we just generally add some water to that to bring it all together. We can add, add herbs and spices and vegetables depending on the flavors you're looking for and the colors too. So you always want to have that resting stage where you allow it time so that it can relax out. You have a lot of gluten buildup in that pasta dough and you need to allow it to rest. Otherwise, as you try to roll it, it will actually start pulling back in again. The dough should be smooth and moist to the touch. And so after about 15 to 30 minutes, then you can roll it out into thin sheets. So you can hold fresh, um, or uncooked pasta in the refrigerator for one to two days. We should always look at the type of pasta and the type of sauce you add to it to complement one another. So we have long flat pastas, generally we'll, with those we'll serve a cream sauce. With tube and twisted pasta, we very often will serve a tomato or meat sauce with it. Pastas can be covered and baked as well. We use light sauces uh, with filled pasta, and very often, uh, so we'll be cooking one pound of dry pasta in one gallon of liquid. That generally gives it enough space in there, and that's key when you're cooking pasta to give it enough room so that it can move around so that you don't get areas um, that trap in um, dryness so that they don't fully cook nice and evenly. One pound of dry pasta would yield about three pounds of cooked pasta as it absorbs a significant amount of that water. One pound of fresh pasta yields about two pounds of cooked pasta because it's already, uh, it already has some water content to it, so it doesn't absorb as much.
So yes, when you're boiling pasta, make sure you bring a large pot of water to the boil. Add salt to it because we're going to be looking to season that uh, that pasta right from this uh, right from the start. There, you want to add the pasta and stir. Make sure that water is boiling. Um, you want to uh, have it so it's all nice and separated out as you're cooking it, um, and cook it at a nice simmer. Um, cook until it's done, but with where it's al dente, where it has a slight bite to it. Stirring it continuously um, while it, uh, while it's uh, cooking. Make sure you drain the pasta well. Use a colander or a strainer to do that, and then serve it immediately. So, lastly, when we're looking at cooking dumplings, so these these dumplings are uh, including things like spetzel and gnocchi. So this is where we're making them with a dough or a batter, and so very often we'll be using things like potatoes as the starch. So we'll be shaping them into into small round balls, and then. Uh, when we're cooking them, we'll we'll cut them open just to uh, just to test their doneness. They don't take very long at all to actually cook. You're going to simmer them, steam them, poach them, uh, bake them, or even deep fry them. I think you judge something. <laughs> What's that? I'm adventurous and I love getting into new territory, but I don't really know if I want to get into. You know what? I don't want to be disrespectful. I mean, what is this supposed to be? <laughs> Why would you make them this big? Eh beh, non so cos'è. Non voglio, non la voglio. It's like the new Rubik's Cube. <laughs> The world of potatoes, grains, and pasta in the culinary world is so vast, but it gives us so many options. If you have any questions, please get with me. Apart from that,